morning. Um, the economic singularity, as I'm sure you all know, is the scenario in which technological unemployment does arrive and either forces or requires major changes to the economy. And for those of you at the back, we saved some seats for you, for you at the front here, loads of seats. Let's see if we can get, fill up all the seats. So automation is not new, and automation obviously is what's driving this. Automation is not new. We've had it for centuries, since before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But previously, it has not caused lasting, widespread human unemployment. And the reason for that is that most rounds of, of automation previously have been mechanization. They've taken our muscle jobs. And we humans had another trick up our sleeve. We had our cognitive abilities. It didn't work out so well for the horse. In 1915, there were 21 and a half million horses working in America. And now there are pretty much none. And the population of horses in America today is about 2 million. That is some pretty serious technological unemployment. Now we have a new type of automation, and it's cognitive automation, taking our cognitive jobs. We have seen some before. Back in 1978, the uh, states marked blue in this map are states where secretary was the most common job description. And they have pretty much all been automated, mostly by Microsoft Office. Now, today, the states marked green in this map, the most common job description is truck driver. There's three million of them, and another two million other professional drivers in the US. Now, what happens to these people when this stuff arrives? We don't know yet when self-driving technology will be ready for prime time, but it's not far off. Uh, you can get in, well, you can't, but members of the public can get in a completely self-driving car in, in Phoenix, operated by Google spin-out company Waymo. And there is no driver, there is no chaperone in the front. You just sit in the back. The thing is, a human operator of a, of a commercial vehicle accounts for a quarter to a half of the, cost of, the, of, the, of the operating cost of that vehicle. So as soon as the technology is ready for prime time, fleet operators will have to adopt it. Otherwise, they'll go out of business. So once it's ready, within the next 10 to 15 years, it's very hard to see how all those jobs aren't going to go. So there's going to be, probably, some road rage against the machines. And I was talking to a, a, a convention of American police officers last week in Phoenix. And uh, I said to them, quite a lot of these guys have got guns. Now, what will those truck drivers do when they can't drive trucks anymore? Traditionally, they would probably go and work in factories or warehouses or perhaps in call centers. But obviously, automation is going to be reducing employment there as well. And it's not true that it is only low-paid, repetitive work which is going to be automated. There are machines now which can carry out surgery better than human doctors. They're slow, expensive, a bit buggy, but that will change. And for the first time in history, probably, lawyers are at the bow wave of a technological development. Disclosure and discovery is being automated. Doesn't really matter whether you're white collar or blue collar. The AI is colorblind. It will take the job of the white collar person just as much as the person who makes that white collar. I think we need to bite the bullet. I think we need to accept that within a generation, many, many people will be unemployable, probably a majority. Now, this isn't going to happen next year or in the next five years, and probably not in the next 10 years. But I think it, in longer term than that, it will probably happen. Now, of course, we don't know for sure. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't guarantee this will happen. It just seems extremely plausible. A lot of people think this is nonsense. They think it's the Luddite fallacy, because we had automation in the past, and it didn't cause lasting widespread unemployment. That argument is pretty weak. It basically says, Past performance is a guarantee of future outcome. We know, we know that's not true. If it was, we wouldn't be able to fly. But people make the very reasonable argument that we will work in tandem with machines. And that is clearly true. In fact, I agree with Paul. I've read his book. I agree with him. In the short run, AI will create more jobs as we learn better how to work with machines. But I think what people fail to take into account is the importance of thinking on a slightly longer time frame than five to 10 years. And Many, many people fail to take into account the phenomenal power of, an ex of exponential growth. So the machines we have in 10 years' time, thanks to Moore's law, will be 128 times more powerful than the machines we have today. In 20 years' time, if Moore's law still holds, and it probably will, that the underlying idea of Moore's law, that machines get twice as powerful every 18 months or so, in 20 years' time, they'll be 8,000 times more powerful. And in 30 years' time, a million times more powerful. That human-machine partnership looks to be dominated by machines in the medium term. So I think the people who are completely skeptical about this are guilty of the reverse Luddite fallacy. And I think that's dangerous, but I also think it's pessimistic. 
Uh, a Gallup poll a couple of years ago found that 8% of people around the world really enjoy their jobs, they're really engaged in their jobs. Everybody else does it to put food on the table. Wouldn't it be a great world if we could arrange things so that machines did the jobs and humans got on with the important business of living, which is learning and exploring and socialising and having fun? And I think this is possible. There are some problems. The big one is income. How on earth do we get enough money to everybody who's not doing a job? And anybody in the political left at the moment is thinking universal basic income. And I don't think that's the right answer. I agree with the noted economist uh, John Kay, who says that universal basic income, if it's high enough to be any use, it's unaffordable. And if it's affordable, it's too low to be of any use. The, the basic problem with basic income is right in the middle of the phrase, it's basic. If we have, let's say, half the human population in 30 years unemployable, if all we can do is give them a basic income, then we have failed and society is probably not sustainable. So I think this is the step that people miss, the first of two steps that people miss. Firstly, we're going to have to, in a post-jobs world, have a transfer of, of um, assets and finance from those who are still working, still doing jobs, and those who have assets to everybody else. The only way that's affordable is if we achieve the economy of abundance, the Star Trek economy. And I know that sounds a bit nuts, but you can already see it starting to happen. Think about the music industry. When I grew up, it was impossible, even for a rich person, to have access to all the music that they might, ever might want to listen to. And now it's 10 bucks a month. And it's not just in digital weightless goods that this applies. Take transportation. If you remove, remove the human driver, if you convert the vehicle to electric, so there's not lots of explosions going on and many fewer moving parts, and you make the power source nearly free, and solar cells are on an exponentially declining cost curve, then transportation becomes very, very cheap, very affordable. And you can replicate that across the economy. In fact, it's happening. We're probably going there whether we like it or not. This chart shows that Americans are continuing to consume more and more stuff, but they're using fewer and fewer resources to do it. But here's the second step that people miss. People are not stupid. They will see these robots driving around, taking people's jobs, and they will think, whether they're a plumber or an actuary or whatever they are, they'll think, it won't be long before that, job comes, that, that machine or machine like it comes for my job. And there'll be a panic. And panics are very dangerous, because panics lead to very nasty <laughs> populist politicians of the left or the right being elected. Worth avoiding. We need a plan. We need to work out whether technological unemployment really is a possibility, or whether I'm just smoking something. And if so, can we get to the economy of abundance, and how do we do it, and how do we reassure everybody that that is where we're going? So I do think the reverse Luddite fallacy is dangerous. And at the moment, most, of, most uh, of our leaders, most thought leaders, are not really thinking about this. In fact, of the people in this country who are thinking about it, quite a lot are in this room. So we've all got a job to do to wake up our political leaders who are just not thinking about it at all, to wake up our tech leaders, and I don't include Paul, uh, who, are, who are deeply in denial about it. Because if we do grasp the challenge, we can have an amazing world, a wonderful world for ourselves, our kids, and our grandchildren, a world in which machines do the boring stuff and humans do the worthwhile, interesting stuff. Thank you.